On this episode of What's Going On with Shipping, we look at the top 10 U.S. ports according to Container News, looking at their throughput and the number of containers over the past year, 2020. Hi, this is Sal Mercagliano, Associate Professor of History at Campbell University, former Merchant Mariner, and an adjunct instructor in, mar in Maritime Industry Policy at the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy. So a few days ago, Container News came out with the top 10, the, the busiest container ports in the United States. I love a good top 10 list. Grew up watching David Letterman, so how can you not like a good top 10 list? So I thought I'd run you through the top 10 list, talk about each of these ports, and what's going on in their development and why they should be of importance to you knowing what are the top 10 US ports. So in true Letterman fashion, we'll start with number 10 and work our way up. So at number 10 comes the Port of Miami. Now, when you think of the Port of Miami, you may not think of it as a container terminal. If anybody thinks of anything about Miami, it is as a cruise ship terminal. And it is, it's, it's obviously the largest in the United States in terms of cruise ships. But in terms of containers, about a million containers went through the Port of Miami in 2020. And a lot of that has to do with the geographic location of the port and more importantly, its population. We have a large population den density at the very southern tip of the Florida Peninsula. So a large port there makes sense. And the Port of Miami is such that. They receive a lot of ships, a lot of cargo come through there and that necessitates their port development. Now, other thing that's going on with the Port of Miami that's really interesting is their attempt to become a much greener port. So again, this is a port that deals with a lot of passenger liners coming in. And all too typically, passenger liners in the past would come into port, they would tie up there along uh, the berth, and basically keep their engines running, turn over their passengers and head back out. So come in, in the morning, leave in the evening. And one of the things that does is expels a lot of pollution into the air. So one of the big issues going on right now is to get shore power ashore so that the vessels can basically plug in, turn their engines off, stop emitting all that pollutants and prevent the growth of pollution right there in the port. So the Port of Miami is definitely becoming one of these key ports to look at in terms of its green evolution and its green initiatives. Next up is the Port of South Carolina. And this is basically Charleston, but it includes several terminals within the Ashley and Cooper River area. The Port of Charleston, the Port of Georgetown, the Inland Port uh, Greer and Inland Port Dillon. All of this is part of a larger entity that is the Port of Charleston, uh, excuse me, the Port of uh, South Carolina. And South Carolina ports handled almost a little over 2.3 million TEUs. And one of the things we're seeing is the growth of ports along the East Coast of the United States. And this is largely due to the expansion of the Panama Canal in 2016. In 2016, the Panama Canal opened up a new lane. Uh, much like the Suez Canal expanded its canal in 2015, in 2016, the Panama Canal opened its lane. The difference between the two is the Panama Canal expansion began early, almost a decade earlier. And when they were making that expansion plan to put the third lane in, they envisioned the top size of vessels being about 15,000 containers. They did not plan for the ultra large container ships, much like Ever Given, and hitting 20,000 to 24,000 boxes. But this enlargement still had a massive input because now vessels that previously were limited to five, 8,000 boxes, now you're talking about 12 to 15,000 boxes can come through the Panama Canal and call at these new East Coast ports. And so ports like Miami and now the South Carolina ports, and we'll talk about a few others here, are expanding. They're increasing their terminals. They're increasing their container cranes, the size of their container cranes. They're increasing the draft of the vessels that can come in there. We saw that recently with the Marco Polo coming in for CGM lines. And one of the things we're seeing is these ports become much more responsive to containers as the West Coast in particular is suffering its massive slowdowns coming through this, the Panama Canal and now coming into the East Coast ports is a viable alternative. Actually coming through the Suez Canal, through the Mediterranean to the East Coast is also equally viable, believe it or not. It's about an equal distance from Shanghai to the East Coast of the United States, whether you come through the Panama Canal or the Suez Canal. 
The next port here is on the West Coast, and that is the Port of Oakland. This is the major port in the San Francisco Bay Area. So one of the big differences between East Coast and West Coast is West Coast has only a few major ports, uh, really three of them. Uh, and we're going to talk about the three of them in this list, whereas the East Coast Gulf Coast has dozens of ports. And because there's only a few ports on the West Coast, we see them very much concentrated and we see their growth and we see them on this list. So the Port of Oakland handles a little bit over 2.4 million containers in 2020. And one of the things that Oakland has the potential to do is see growth. Right across from this terminal is the old Alameda Naval Air Station that has been closed down. One of the big pushes has been to try to develop that, that air base into another container facility. Unfortunately, it's hit a lot of obstructions. Uh, in this image right here, you can see across the way, you can see the runways of the old airport right there. If you ever watch old episodes of Mythbusters, where they do all their uh, experiments there on the runways, you'll see the container terminal right across from each other. Uh, Oakland was a major shipment hub throughout its history. Uh, we see it, it was the Port of San Francisco, and then it moved over here to Oakland to be that. Oakland has the potential to expand and grow. One of the big things that's kind of restricting Oakland, and we'll see that with another West Coast terminal, is its access to rail and roadways. That's been the real big limitation on the port of Oakland, but definitely deserves to be ranked on this list. One of the images you'll see consistently in here is the arrival of these new container cranes coming in on these heavy lift ships. Uh, you need these new container cranes to be able to reach higher and, and further out to hit these larger container ships, especially on the West Coast. As the West Coast expands and they can start handling these ultra large container ships once the draft is done, you've dredged out the harbor. If you've got the air draft to get under the bridges into the ports too, that's another limiting factor. Number seven on this list is the Port of Virginia. And the Port of Virginia includes the container terminals, the Norfolk International Gateway and the Virginia International Gateway. Uh, Virginia is handling 2.8 million containers a year. Again, Virginia, much like South Carolina ports, just like Miami, are fighting to get these larger vessels into their port. And you can see that with the expansion in the ports. Uh, the Hampton Roads area, the Norfolk, Virginia area is, is a massive seaport, as you can see right here. This is looking northward from the Norfolk International Terminal. Uh, you can see up, up at the very top here, this is the uh, Norfolk Navy base right here, NOB Norfolk. Over here on the left is the Craney Island Fuel Facility. And if you go up here into Hampton Roads area where the Monitor and the Merrimack fought, Fortress Monroe is up here, Newport News Shipbuilding is right up here. And if you head to the right there, head back out into Chesapeake Bay, you can head back out through the Virginia Capes. And Virginia is in the process of really expanding their port. They're, again, they're looking to get more cargo in there and handle larger and larger ships, hence, hence the expansion. Uh, you can see some fairly good-sized vessels. Here's the CMA, CGM vessels in port right there. Is an even better picture of the terminals right there. If the Port of Virginia has a limiting factor, it has to be the access in and out of the port by rail and highways because of being on a peninsula. You can see that. You can see the old railway heads coming in here uh, where they were. There's some bulk facilities right here for getting grain and, and uh, used to be coal facilities coming out of here. You can see that right there, the grain terminals, the uh, uh, coal facilities right there coming in. Uh, some more of the container terminals up here. Just a, a potential for the Port of Virginia to expand even further. Again, its biggest constraint is going to be that access out of the ports into the interior. But as population shifts further south in the United States, these ports become much more important south of the Mid-Atlantic. Number six, at nearly 3 million TEUs is the port of Houston, Texas. Now we tend to think of Houston, Tex Texas, not as a container terminal. In truth, Houston is one of the busiest ports in the United States in terms of tonnage, but it's mainly due to petroleum and oil products, liquefied natural gas, you name it. But Houston, Texas, obviously this is a main port to get containers in, to get into the middle part of the United States, the Midwest area. And 3 million containers is a, substantial number. Uh, limitations in the port of Houston are several. Uh, one of the biggest ones is the channel coming into the port at Houston. Uh, needs to be dredged, needs to be widened. And matter of fact, sailing into Houston is, is, is anyone who's ever done it before will tell you is, is always an adventure. 
because of the width of the channel, uh, you have to play basically chicken with vessels coming the other way. Uh, Houston uh, pilots are notorious for this, for playing the Houston ship channel chicken. Uh, they'll come at each other straight and at the very last minute turn and pass very close to each other uh, in the channel. Uh, it'll result periodically in some, uh, uh, some papes, uh, paint scraping, but uh, the Houston uh, pilots are some of the finest in the world. They uh, really know exactly what they're doing. But Houston is a big all around port uh, petroleum, uh, bulk commodities come out of there in addition to containers. Okay, it's hard to compete with the Northwest uh, Seaport Alliance, Seattle and Tacoma for a beautiful port to come into when you have mountains in the background. Uh, but Seattle and Tacoma both come in there as the next big port on the West Coast. We talked about Oakland already. This is the next one at 3.3 million containers. So a, a substantial port, C uh, Seattle and Tacoma, both have been seeing expansions, uh, largely because of the delays down in Los Angeles, Long Beach. It's shifted into Oakland as Oakland shifts into full gear. We've seen even delays at Seattle and Tacoma. And that's also been true of the container terminal just to the north across the border in Vancouver. And while Seattle and Tacoma haven't been able to handle the biggest vessels coming across, one of their big advantages, they're closer to the Far East than Los Angeles, Long Beach. Uh, again, the world's not flat. Don't look at a flat map. You got to look at a globe, look at Google Earth. And when you make that great circle path from the east coast of Asia, you pass through the Aleutian Islands and then you come down the North American coast. The very first U.S. port you hit is Seattle and Tacoma. Uh, absolutely beautiful. If there's an issue with Seattle and Tacoma, it's its access to the interior being in the northwest where it is. Railways, highways limit its ability to get cargo out, especially to the population, where the population is. It's been undergoing a big expansion. You see these new container cranes coming in. Uh, and again, the port has been expanding and enlarging in its scope and scale. So if there's a port to watch, I would tell you it's this port right here. This is the Port of Savannah at nearly 4.7 million TEU. Uh, the Port of Savannah is one of the fastest growing ports right now in the United States. It has taken advantage of that expanded Suez Canal. It's accommodating larger vessels. They've undertaken a huge dredging operation there to get their channel deeper. Uh, but more importantly is really some geography here with this port. Uh, this port has a very short distance from the sea buoy from coming from the ocean to the berth. Uh, it straddles two major highways, uh, I-95 and, and, and I-20. It also, has access to railways, airports, uh, just makes it a, a ideal location for the development of, of an extremely large intermodal facility. Add to it, you have a large uh, railroad facility not far away in Brunswick, Georgia, and really South Carolina, uh, Georgia ports is, is, is fast, fast expanding in terms of its size, giving South Carolina ports and uh, Virginia ports a run for their money. I'm not going to be surprised to see Savannah really continue this growth and escalation as the years go on. Uh, they are poised to really take more and more cargo and traffic, especially as, as population shifts further and further south in the United States. This brings us to the top three. And uh, number three is the biggest one on the East Coast, and that's the port of New York, New Jersey, handling uh, over uh, roughly 7.6 million containers. Obviously, a major port, a uh, huge amount of shipping channels in the port uh, operating along Staten Island and the Jersey Coast right there. Uh, you can see the, just the, the size and growth here. Massive dredging operations have been undertaken to get larger and larger vessels coming through the Panama Canal in there. Uh, it is a bustling port. It's right astride I-95. You've got the Newark International Airport there. You have rail lines. Uh, you have a huge population right there to get into the Mid-Atlantic and New England area. Uh, just absolutely a, a biggest port that you see. Back in the day when you had the finger piers along Manhattan and Brooklyn, you can bring freighters right in. But what was needed as introduced by Malcolm McLean in 1956 with these containers, is you needed a facility with lay down area, with area you can develop flat land that you can plow down and, and put uh, basically facilities, and that's Jersey. And so this, this, this port has grown. Uh, you've even seen the raising of infrastructure, the Bayonne Bridge, for example, had to be raised to accommodate these larger ships. And, and I'll, I'll 
give you a little bit of, of an editorial here. That cost was basically on was 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 basically on the backs of New Jersey residents. They had to pay for that. Yet most of the containers that come into the port of New York, New Jersey, don't go to New Jersey. They go throughout the United States. And the companies that benefited from this were the shipping companies. Uh, but they didn't really pay for that. Instead, it was done by state and local residents. There's a big push for port infrastructure right now in the United States. And again, I don't get political here. You know, there was a push in, in, in the pre previous administration. There's a push right now. And federal government makes more sense for port infrastructure than state governments. Even though the port may be in the port of New Jersey, New York, it has national importance. At the same time, I think these carriers, especially these foreign carriers, are taking benefits from that. By, by raising the Bayonne Bridge, you allow larger vessels to come in, meaning they can carry more cargo, meaning economy of scale, meaning right now when they're making massive profits, some of that money should be being reinvested back into these ports. I think that's an issue that needs to be discussed some. The Federal Maritime Commission, the Maritime Administration, government officials, Secretary of Transportation, Commerce, Interior, this all needs to be issues that are discussed. Ports number one and two are right next to each other and sometimes they're lumped in together, but they are two separate ports. So the first one here is the Port of Long Beach, 8.1 million TEU. Uh, the port of Long Beach handles a variety of different commodities beyond just containers. They do bulk cargo, they do fuel, they do oil, but it is one of the biggest uh, terminals, obviously, in the United States. 22 shipping terminals, six of which are container vessels, serving over 175 shipping lines, and it connects to over 217 seaports around the world, making Long Beach one of the key strategic assets in the United States. Just a massive port here. You can see its development. A lot of this is artificial added. You see this expansion in here for the creation of this. Unfortunately, due to California laws, I don't know if you'll see much more expansion of these laydown areas and these terminals. One of the advantages Long Beach had, it was able to recycle the old uh, Navy facility that was in there and turn it into uh, uh, this commercial area. As a matter of fact, if you look, I think I had an image right here somewhere. Yep. Uh, right up over here was where the old uh, um, uh, Navy Yard used to be. Matter of fact, they even filled in a dry dock uh, to get more laydown area there for them so that they can develop the port of Long Beach into something more. And the final one is the port of Los Angeles, which is the busiest port in the United States. It's, it's been the busiest container port in the United States for the past 20 years. Uh, this report cites them at 9.2 million TEU, but we know for the physical year, which ended on June 30th, that the Port of Los Angeles exceeded 10 million containers. So Port of Los Angeles, definitely uh, up there for, for good reason. It bustles, even though it operates just two shifts, it's not on a 24-hour cycle. And one of the reasons has to do with some earlier reports we talked about in the inability to get containers off the terminal and into the interior because of trucks and more importantly now because of rail. There was just a story we talked about the other day that the Union Pacific Railway has put a one week boycott in picking up containers out of the West Coast to ship to the interior, meaning there's gonna be more containers piling up in these terminals until they can get off. Automation, which we see throughout a lot of ports in the Far East, which increases productivity would not do you much good if you can't get these containers off the terminal. The big thing is to get them on trucks and trains and out of the facilities and on the way. And one of the things they're hoping to do here is basically clear this backlog in railway facilities so that they can be more efficient. This is looking southward from the Port of Los Angeles. Uh, Port of Los Angeles stretches all the way up here into the interior, all the way down here. All of that is part of the Los Angeles. Long Beach is up over here. This is all Long Beach. This is where the Navy Yard used to be in Long Beach right here. The basin here is all used right up into this area out here. It is a massive, massive area. There's a huge breakwater here that creates the basic area where this port resides and generates the amount of containers that we see throughout this terminal. Those are the top 10 ports in the United States for containers. We're talking over 44 million containers coming into the United States being handled in these ports. It gives you an idea of the amount of trade going on. And what we see is that number growing and getting bigger every year. 
uh, just because of global transportation. We've seen it, you know, dip down. We saw it dip down in 2020 a little bit because of COVID. We saw it dip down in 2008 because of the global recession. But right now it is just, we see a massive increase. We still have vessels waiting to get in and berths off the West Coast of the United States. We start starting to see lines on the East Coast at ports like Savannah and Charleston and into the Hampton Roads area. But again, uh, this is right now the most efficient way to move cargo by containers. Previous to this, you were moving it by brake bulk, wooden pallets that took a lot of time, a lot of handling. It was just not as efficient as intermodalism. Uh, and again, this has been around since 1956. And one of the things we're seeing is this, this, this method to move cargo is only growing in scope and scale. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. I uh, want to appreciate uh, uh, Container News for putting this out there and for being able to use this and posting this. Uh, if you enjoyed the video, please subscribe to the channel. Go ahead and hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. Give it a thumbs up because that gets into that algorithm that YouTube has and it'll share it across the, the YouTube spectrum. Also, feel free to share it on social media, whatever platform you use. And until our next episode, this is Sal signing off.